Hello and welcome back to the Not Fade Away podcast. I am your host, Margot D. Today, my special guest is Leslie Ann Coles. She's the producer and director of an excellent documentary called Melody Makers, The Bible of Rock and Roll, which is available for streaming right now. You can find us on all social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Not Fade Away Podcast. For comments and suggestions, you can feel free to email me, notfadeawaypodcast at gmail.com. If you're not familiar with Melody Maker, it was a magazine based in London that was launched in the 1920s to honor jazz music. By the time the 60s and 70s rolled around, the music they talked about and featured and took beautiful photographs of were basically classic rock musicians, classic rock music, or prog rock. So we're thinking the animals, Jethro Tull, Pink Floyd. Yes, you get the idea. So she talks to many musicians in this documentary. She talks to the most amazing photographers you're going to hear from. There's just beautiful photography featured in this documentary. And she just has some great stories about how she put this all together. I think you guys are going to really love Leslie. Be sure to check out her movie as soon as you can. Oh, and by the way, it's also an Apple book, an iBook. And she talks a little bit about that. And it's super cool. You guys need to check it out. So without further ado, let's just get into my interview today with Leslie Ann Coles, producer and director of Melody Makers, the Bible of rock and roll. So welcome to the show, Leslie. Hi, thank you. Thank Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So it's Melody Makers and it's this Bible of rock and roll, the, the Melody Makers magazine, and you directed the documentary for it and you've written a companion book for it that's super interesting. Can you talk to my audience a little bit about your background, like how you got this project and what it took to put it all together? Well, it's, it's a good question. It took a long time to finish the documentary. It started, you know, as a series, actually, a limited doc series about various photographers who captured diff- different musical genres as they emerged. So Mick Rock out of New York, he ca- captured the whole glam scene, Bob Bruin, punk, Jill Fromnofsky, you know, different photographers who, who were there when these different uh, musical genres sort of hit the scene at pop, jazz, reggae, all of that. So, but it coincided with reality television. So reality television sort of hit the scene and, you know, I won a fellowship to Banff with it, but no one was really buying or buying into a limited entertainment doc series. So they were all going for the reality television at the time. So I kind of put it on the back burner. I had interviewed Barry and then I thought, you know, I'm just going to do a, 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 an interesting sort of intimate artist portrait about this photographer who happened to immigrate to Canada in the early 1990s. I met him in 96 and he took photos from one of my first films and I always knew I was going to turn the camera on him anyway. So I ended up shooting him um, with his photographs sort of as the other subjects in the film. And that's why there's sort of these little intimate, we call it story time with Barry, where I just said, let's put a whole bunch of photos on the table and let's just have you pick them up randomly and let's talk about them. Let's talk about what was going on in and around the time that you took that shot of Pink Floyd or the Rolling Stones or Jimi Hendrix. And and that's kind of how we did that. And then he kept saying to me, hey, you got to go and and meet my mates, my colleagues in the UK who worked with me on Melody Maker magazine, because that's how he amassed that massive, iconic rock and roll collection of photos. Um, It was during his tenure on Melody Maker magazine. So I pulled back the film. I thought this is a bigger story. Did some research about Melody Maker magazine and then got some money from our government because Canadian uh, Canada has public funding, um, you know, for for films. And they gave me some development money. And I went to the UK and I interviewed um, the journalists and DJs and record producers and managers and other people who work behind the scenes of Melody Maker magazine when it was in its heyday, which was 1965 to 1975 when Barry was there. So that's kind of how it all happened. And it took about eight years to finally finish the film. It was a long journey. Yeah, I, I imagine. And then I thought of years ago, before there was really any more active uh, digital media for an app. It was sort of when apps were hitting. And I was thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could download 
like an app that would video and a really great assortment of photos from the collection that we could screen save or just pose as in like in a gallery and have embedded video because I realized that I had over 200 hours of footage too. And I had to find a way to, to utilize it. And it didn't make the cut for the film if it didn't serve the trajectory of the story, which is about Barry's journey on Melody Maker magazine and Melody Maker magazine, sort of the rise and fall of, of the seminal magazine that was really the forerunner to Rolling Stones. So that's kind of how the Apple book and then I and then it was created using an Apple book uh, format, a template. And that's kind of how that happened. So the Apple book is really cool because it enhances the film. You have photos, rock trivia, picture puzzles. So you've been literally like a Rubik's Cube putting a photo of John Lennon and Yoko Ono together or Cream or The Faces or Zeppelin or whatever. So I'm, I'm excited about that. It was like my fun toy, my fun thing to kind of think around. So I'm glad you I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, it's really fun. I have it on my iPad and on my iPhone. And the other day I was on the subway. I live in New York and I just started, you know, scrolling through the book and it was really fun. Like you said, you have trivia in there and there's all kind of games and there's video and it's like super, super interesting. So I wanted to ask you, like you had so many interviews. Was it a case of like you asked one person then everybody else just kind of showed up? Was it easy to get those people together? Sometimes, like when I was in the UK for the second time shooting, I had a, 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 a proper crew with me and, um, you know, we would interview Dave Cousins and then Dave would say, well, why don't you go and meet Chris Sangardi's or, you know, so-and-so. And then, and then they would jump on and then we'd be racing across, you know, the UK to another interview. So it was a little bit like that. I mean, the way I ended up really making it happen was I, I wanted to have music in the film, obviously. And it was really expensive to option to license the music. So I worked with a composer and the composer lent um, kind of we gathered music rights from the musicians featured in the documentary, which was the way that I cut the soundtrack. So I thought what the best way for me to get authentic music will be to go to the musicians who are actually in the film. And then Roger Waters of Pink Floyd gave me access to some really uh, obscure footage shot by Peter Whitehead, who's gone. He's in the film. And he's in the longer film a little bit more, the 95-minute uh, director's cut. And, um, yeah, so one person kind of let, let me to, led me to another person or one person I researched informed me about another subject. So that's really how it, um, you know, that, that's kind of how it came together. But I found that the journalists who worked on Melody Maker magazine, Barry, they were – they really – the best stories because they were the flies on the wall. They weren't in, you know, in a gig, like the musicians were gigging and they were on the road and they were really focused on what they were doing. So I found that the most entertaining stories actually came from the people that were working behind the scenes. That was the big revelation for me in the making of the film. I guess it's because they're, they're constantly having to tell us the story. You know, that's what writing articles is. It's like setting the stage and telling the story so that maybe they're just thinking that way all the time. So maybe that's why they're, they're great raconteurs. Um, Yes, yes, I would agree with that. That makes a lot of sense. So that was exciting. And they, they were such gracious, humble, lovely people who just kind of stumbled into the scene. I mean, some of them were 16, 17 when they started writing for Melody Maker magazine. Um, So I I don't know, I, I think you know that the history of the paper, it started as a jazz musicians paper in 1926. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really a, a, a fan based music publication. It was really for musicians to recruit other musicians or purchase instruments or, you know, so a lot of bands were actually formed um, from the classified section in the back of the magazine. And, you know, it had a short stint in New York. They decided they were making so much money and there were so many American artists sort of clamoring to get featured in the magazine. They opened up uh, an office and dispatched one journalist um, and it was Chris Charlesworth at the time in 1973 he set up an office in new york but at the time um the the newsstands were all owned by the mob yep and so the brits didn't know who to pay off to get their magazine on the on the stands so it's kind of a funny story about how they had to distribute the films and and what happened to the what i'm not the films the magazines ended up you know on a skip or near kennedy airport somewhere um so it was kind of a a short-lived uh journey in New York. Um, but it's a funny story recounted by Chris Charlesworth, who was there for that three years, um, when they opened up the office. So it's a great story. 
So I wanted to know who were you really excited to meet? You know, who who was the get that you got that got you really excited? <laughs> I would say Peter Whitehead, who was the first filmmaker or the first to actually produce and uh, and create um, uh, what was what we refer to as music videos. So Peter Whitehead shot some of his own independent films and then he just kind of happened into capturing he's charlie my darling he's the guy that shot um the footage the original footage for charlie my darling and he kind of fell into the scene he he documented ginsburg and um a whole bunch of other really cool scenes that that happened in the uk during this period and then he ended up becoming the um filmmaker, videographer for what were referred to as music videos back in the day. So he shot Eric Burden's first video once when we were young. And the great story about how he he obtained the, the archival plane footage for that. He literally found it in a garbage can, like in a skip. And he brought it home and it was 35 mil war footage and he cut it into that that song. But that was one of the first music, I think it was the the first like quote unquote music video. So I was really excited to meet Peter Whitehead. He doesn't, he didn't, didn't do a lot of interviews, but he graciously afforded me one. And then Eric Burden. Mm -hmm. I love Eric Burden. He is such a lovely man and he was a great interview and he was very generous with his time. I mean, I have to say Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull was really awesome as well. I caught them on the road. So I was chasing musicians off and on for about two years as they were on tour. So I would just find out where they were when they were going to be in Canada, and then I would find them and and beg to do an interview. And I missed Townsend a bunch of times. It's unfortunate because he was keen to do the interview, and so was Ray Davies of the Kinks. So those were two interviews I didn't get that I really regret. But I would have to say Eric Burden for sure, you know, was a real highlight for me. And uh, Peter Whitehead, the filmmaker, videographer, um, yeah, and Ian Anderson. And some of them are gone, gone right? Right. So, having met. You know, um, Chris Squire of Yes was a great honor. Peter's gone. Chris Sangardi's gone. I mean, there a lot of them. You know, some of them have passed since I made the film. So I'm, I'm I feel really honored to have met them. What was your relationship with music? Like, what were you into when you were a kid? When did you get excited about music? And what were you into? Um, well, you know, I think the first album I remember, or the first two albums I really remember, it was an album my dad used to sing, not professionally, but sort of the blues and stuff, and, and he loved R&B, and there was a, an album called Mashed Potato Time that he had, <laughs> I playing that over and over and over again, um, and, and uh, oh my God, you know, I mean, I love all music, I mm -hmm. love this, I love rock and roll, I love jazz, I loved punk. Punk was a really great scene for me. So I'm pretty, I have a pretty eclectic appreciation of music, I have to say. And, you know, people always say, oh, you must love music. You, you made this film, you know, you must love rock and roll. And I do love rock and roll, but it was really the photographs that attracted, to, uh, attracted me to, the, to making this documentary. Because I would, you know, photographs are, you know, there it's a moment that's captured in time. There's so much around it and within it in terms of memory. And it was really Barry's anecdotal stories and recollections of uh, when he looked at his photos and the stories that he would tell us, me and others, that really uh, captured my imagination. And they were just so evocative and so beautiful. I mean, his photos are incredible, whether they're in a state of repose or whether a live action shot you know, his photographs really spoke to me. And it seems to kind of be a recurring theme in my films because mm -hmm. my first film, um, Barry took photos for it and it, and it and it had archival photographs in it as well. So I think that's kind of the theme for me, that idea of reflecting back through a visual, a still visual image. I want to talk a little bit about punk rock because it is it was a huge shift. You know, people thought it was only happening in England. And it turns out it happened everywhere. But it, yep. the, the scene changed completely from Pink Floyd and yes to the Ramones and the Sex Pistols. It's like the, the attitude changed quickly. So can you give a little bit of like talking about punk rock and its evolution and the rivalry between Melody Maker and New Music Express? Yeah, so it, it's an interesting history. They had a long history and they actually played darts together. I mean, they were, they were friendly with each other. They just, you know, MM, Melody Maker, really surpassed enemy 
for years and years and years. And you're right. So when punk hit, you know, again, like rock and roll, the people thought it was a flash in the pan and that it wasn't really going to stick. And the punks had a different, the punks had a different attitude. I mean, they would just be like, fuck you. Like, you know, they didn't want to do an interview and they, and they hated the establishment and resented the old guard. So there was just a kind of a whole scene that happened. It was different. It was a different mentality. The punks, um, uh, you know, and Melody Maker and the journalists at Melody Maker really didn't understand punk. It wasn't their scene. So Enemy globbed onto it and captured it. And it was lightning in a bottle. I mean, they just, they, they started selling more magazines. They surpassed Melody Maker. When I went to the British library i noted that they you could really see that they really tried to salvage melody maker by changing the masthead and going from a a newspaper format style paper to a small glossy print um but that that's basically what brought them down i mean that was the whole the, the fact that they kind of gave up what they were doing and tried to emulate not emulate but tried to speak to the punk movement and in that they they kind of lost their core audience mm-hmm. the, which were hardcore uh rock and roll jazz you know fans and um yeah and the world changed and also you have to know that by the mid 70s you know music was a big business and they didn't have the access that they had the doors started sort of closing and there were a lot of handlers there were a lot of you know there were managers and there were so many more people involved that I remember interviewing or or not formally interviewing, but speaking to a photographer in the UK who shot Madonna and the Beastie Boys. And, and he said, you know, that he would be after an interview, he would never be shooting. I'm sorry, say that again. During an interview, which he would never be shooting. He, He was a photographer and he said, I would never be taking photographs during an active. Like, so Barry had the camera while the writer, the journalist was doing the interview, he would be taking photographs. And a lot of the photographers told me who came up in the mid late seventies, eighties said we would get, you know, maybe the first three songs in a concert to take some snaps. And then if we were lucky after the interview, we would be able to take some photos for five minutes, but it would be really set up. We didn't, we weren't, they weren't able to just take photographs during the actual interviews it really changed. And so with that, I think, you know, access changed. And and with the advent of punk, you know, uh, their relationship to the artists changed as well. So I don't know if I answered your question. No, you but... did. You did. It was no, it was, but it's very interesting how you say that because it's it's funny for me, like re- doing bits for the show and record. And I pull media clips for the show, um, my show, and sometimes like if um, I have an inter- I had a great interview with Jim Morrison being oh, interviewed. Cool. Yeah, and he's being interviewed, and like you said, I could hear the clicking of a photographer, and I'm like, oh, that's right. They used to just let people take pictures and do an interview at the same time, and it was yeah. no big deal. And then I've done some publicity yeah. in the 90s and early aughts and yeah you're right if they could come to the concert I like they could maybe do two songs and they had to go like all of that access is so yeah. different now yeah and Barry speaks to that in the film he he talks about you know the concert with the Stones and you know Jagger came out and said okay the musicians you know have to leave after the third song and he was like, what? I mean, that was a real turning point for him. And he left shortly thereafter. And that's when he immigrated to Canada. But yeah, things really changed. And also, they were discovering bands. They were kind of hitting little clubs and pubs. And, and, and you know, they would see a really great band. And they would be like, oh, the world needs to know about this. And they would, they would promote them through the magazine or put them on the front page and then it became that the managers and other people were saying, no, you have to go and take a photograph of this musician. This is going to be the hot, you know, so things were set mm-hmm. up and staged and there were a lot of handlers. And yeah, they, he, they, the days were gone of being able to just sort of shoot, uh, take snaps during an actual interview. But that's how he got those great photos. Right. Right. Yeah. Those candid shots. He was just able to capture them in that moment whether they were looking out a window or you know and he used natural light which was really interesting he was really a master of working with you know natural light he didn't have huge kits that he brought with him and he he didn't set up lights that was very unusual for that you know to actually happen um so yeah it's an interesting it was an interesting time 
you said you you recorded just so many hours, you know, for the documentary, and you have so much left over. And you were you and I were just talking off the air. Like, what are your hopes for that in the future? Are you going to create more Apple Books, or what is that? Well, you know, ideally, I think it would be a really great. I mean, currently, the Apple Book, the Melody Makers Apple Book that I I've, I've released has interview clips with Barry and in that it's it's a satisfying little book because it, it's about 52 pages but it's Barry alone who brings us through sort of his journey and he tickles um his time at Melody Makers when it was in its heyday um but what I would like to do is I would like to do a, a second and a third version and use the the same format to release the b-roll in the film. So I have great interviews with Eric Burden, um, you know, Ian Anderson. Oh my goodness. Uh, Steve Howe of yes. Talking about the making of his lateral guitars. There's so many great interviews, but they didn't, if they didn't serve the trajectory of the story, they didn't make the film, but I think it would be a really, really great way to get the footage out there. Like to just, you know, carve a, a, a second or third edition of the Apple book, featuring interviews with the musicians and or you know I could do a whole thing on Peter Whitehead or John Hoppy Hopkins who never made it into the film and he's gone you know but he he's if you look him up he's amazing man what he accomplished in his time in London with the London Free Schools and starting the International Times which was a paper um, that he founded um, which was a radical paper at, at the time Mm -hmm. um, covering news that the traditional press were were burying. And I just think it's an interesting time speaking to that where we kind of need an influx of this kind of information and to remind us. I th think, you know, the subtext for the film is for me is really spoken through Barry. You know, you know he still adheres to a lot of the the same sort of, he has the same sensibility he did back in the sixties and seventies, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think it's, it, it, there are important messages in that. And I think we need to remember and reflect and think back to a more proactive time when people stood up and youth stood up mm -hmm. and, and rallied against things, not just like Vietnam, but things that weren't, that weren't justifiable, that weren't working, that they opposed. It was a very, very proactive time in America and in the UK and really around the world, but predominantly in, in America and in, in, and in the UK. So I hope that the takeaway for the film and the book is kind of that. Right. Is that, you know, it's a kind of a wake up call. It's kind of a reminder. I mean, it's not a hard boiled documentary. It's an entertaining documentary, mm -hmm. but there is a, a, a deeper meaning in, in the content. And I hope that it's clear in the in the in the viewing of the film and, and hopefully in the, in the book. Well, let me ask you, where can people see your movie? How can they get a chance to see it? Well, here in Los Angeles, it's screening at the uh, arena cine lounge until December the 5th. And it is being released in America by Cleopatra entertainment on December 17th. It's being released on the D and DVD. Oh, great. So it is being released. That's the whole, that's why we're doing the theatrical here. And I kind of pulled it out of the festival circuit. It did about a year and a half in the festival circuit. It won a bunch of awards. It was invited to a New York film festival and then something happened to that festival and it never made it there. And I really am sad about that because people would have remembered it in New York when they had their office there. And I mean, maybe it's not too late. Right. You know, I have a friend here saying you should do a theatrical in New York. Um, but yeah, it's so it will be released on December 17th on VOD and DVD in America. And then it will make its way to the UK. If you're Canadian, um, I'm doing a direct to consumer from my website, MelodyMakersMovie.com. But I am going to be working with a distributor soon as well. Um, and the Apple book is on Apple Books. Um, you can get the Melody Makers book, I think, for $6 or something, six ninety nine U.S. And I've kind of opened that up. It's available now. And what are your plans for the future? Well, I'm working in the scripted space now. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, I mean, other than, other than, you know, looking for a way to get 
to utilize the footage, the all the great interviews from Melody Makers. It's not that I'm not working in the documentary space. It's that I did start in the scripted space. So I'm really excited about a script that I, reach, I recently wrote that actually um, has some traction. And it's, um, it's a Western actually set in 1873 about a posse of women outlaws who... Uh, rescue and repatriate abused and oppressed women and children and and repatriate them to this sanctuary town called Soil Doves. And it's it's kind of like Thelma and Louise meets the Magnificent Seven. I'm in. And it's a lot. It's a lot (laughs) of fun. It's a lot of fun. It actually has a lot of humor, even though it's a grim subject matter. And there's a lot of killing and shooting and hard riding, gun toting women. Um, But it's a lot of fun. So I'm having a a lot of fun. I'm going to give that script another polish. And then I have some other projects. I'm shooting a short drama in February in the snow in Canada. And yeah, so I'm, you know, and I'm hoping that the, the film might might trigger interest in the in the series lens on music to be honest with you i'm hoping that somebody says you know what let's do this because a lot of my subjects are getting older and they'll be gone so i want their stories to be told so please tell us everybody where they can find you where they can find your website and also social media where can you be reached well um and my name leslie ann coles on social media or at uh, L.A. Coles, L.A. and then Coles. And then I have Melody Makers at Melody Makers Movie or at Melody Makers should have been there on Twitter and Instagram. I'm in the space, although I got blocked out of my um, movie Facebook page for some reason. I don't know. There's some ghost profile of me who's occupying it. Oh, no. And I'm trying to crack into it. Yeah, I'm trying to crack into it. It was really bad timing. It happened like a week ago. And I'm like, why can't I manage my page anymore? I can post to it, but I can't tag it. So, yeah, you can. I'm easy to find on social media. I also run um, for filmmakers and women directors in particular. I run a festival out of Toronto called the Female Eye Film Festival, and it's been going 17 years. And we have a lot of really great um, American uh, women directors who, who are celebrated at the festival every year. We just literally celebrated our 17th edition, and we show films directed by women. And this festival um, started in 2001 when I was hitting the festival circuit with my first film, and there weren't any women directors. So I was like, why is that? Hmm, let me look into this. And then we held an event, an event in Toronto, showed 42 films. And now we're 17 years strong and we're competitive. And we show films um, from women directors all over the world. That is so fantastic. I love it. Mm-hmm. It's a good thing. It is a good thing. So thank you. Know, and there's more. Oh, that's okay. No, I was just gonna say it's, it's a wonderful thing. And I, I'm so I'm so glad you took the time to talk to me today. It was so much fun talking to you. Yeah, pleasure speaking with you as well. And thank you so much for your interest in the film and the and the book. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed our chat. Thank you for listening to the Not Fade Away podcast. And if you like what you hear, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you love what you hear, yay, please leave a review. It helps us so much more than you could ever know. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Not Fade Away Podcast. You can email us with comments or suggestions to Not Fade Away Podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to learn more about my other shows, Book vs. Movie, The Fit Bottom Girls, and The Best Neighbors Podcast, just follow me at Brooklyn Fit Chick on all social media or check out my main blog, BrooklynFitChick.com. <laughs>